My name is Mehdi, and I lead the organization that's um, the, the engineering and product team for, for Docker Cloud. Um, we've been at this for a while. You probably know Docker Hub, Docker Cloud. Um, uh, we're here just a little bit about tonight. Logistically, we've we got a few couple of demos and sessions to go through. Then um, our friends at Jobstart will be doing a lightning talk. Um, and they're actually using Docker Cloud to build and deploy their application. Once that's over, we have uh, meet the engineers and experts, folks that are going to be sitting in the back. Everybody should be na wearing a name tag. And so you can walk up and, and ask questions, and we can have con conversations. If it's conversation takes longer, we can use the chairs at the back. A um, couple of things about uh, questions and logistics. So we're going to be tossing this around later. This is a mic. You just toss it around. And you ask questions. So, uh, but we're gonna we're gonna do questions in the end. So, please uh, jot down your questions. Make sure you you, you ask them. Um, but we're gonna do answer all of that in the end. Uh, good questions. Get a Docker Cloud T-shirt in limited uh, stock. Once we're out, we'll just hand out other T-shirts. Uh, good questions. Get a T-shirt. Bad questions. You'll have to. Just kidding. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, Docker Cloud is a container as a service provided by Docker Inc., obviously. Um, you might be working with uh, Docker Hub or Docker Cloud. Uh, it, Docker Cloud enables you to build, deploy your applications. We're actually going to demonstrate a lot of that tonight for you and, and how that's done on the cloud. Um, but before I, I hand over to Ryan here, how many of you have actually used Docker technology? Awesome. How many of you have either used Hub or Docker Cloud? Docker Hub or Docker Cloud? Fantastic. So the reason I ask that, um, I think we're going to get right into it in terms of the technology and the use cases. So uh, a little bit of Docker technology um, knowledge would be very helpful to be able to follow along. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ryan. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. All right. Let's get this set up here. Um, Not as big as we would like, but nonetheless, it's fine. Um, okay, so it's a little loud, but uh, Ryan Kennedy, um, I'm uh, one of the product managers on Docker Cloud. And this evening, we wanted to uh, spend some time talking with you about um, configuring a CI and CD workflow in Docker Cloud. Um, so Mehdi got a poll of how many of you are currently using Hub or Cloud, but how many of you are specifically using um, or have used cloud or its previous incarnation, uh, which was Tutum. Okay, so just a few of you. So we'll we'll go into a uh, brief overview of what cloud is, how it fits into the Docker ecosystem, um, and then we'll get right into a uh, hands-on demo uh, where we'll uh, use the automated build and automated test uh, features in Docker Cloud to uh, configure a CI uh, pipeline. So it's going to be a two-part demo. Uh, the first part, I'll be running to uh, basically configure a, uh, a Docker Cloud with our GitHub account. We have a simple voting app. And then the second part, Brian and Alberto, who uh, are also on the Docker Cloud team, will then pick up and we'll show how you can actually configure a, a CD workflow in Docker Cloud. All right. So a little bit of background. Uh, Docker Inc., as uh, Mehdi alluded to, um, is the company behind um, a lot of things. Uh, the mission that we have at Docker is uh, enabling developers to build, ship, and run distributed applications anywhere. And we do this by two primary channels. The first, which is, uh, we'll start from the bottom, you, most of you are all familiar with, which is the open source project, uh, wildly successful. Uh, Docker is, of course, the main contributor, uh, primary contributor for this. Over 1,500 con contributors uh, to date, 2,000 Dockerized applications. About 40% of these uh, Docker users are actually deploying into production. Uh, the second 
channel is actually what we refer to as the container as a service platform. And so um, this is uh, the, a, a set of discrete uh, components, products that support the build, ship, run workflow. And we offer solutions for both on-premise and uh, cloud-based solutions. And this is commercially supported by Docker. Uh, you know, it comes with uh, uh, the proper support that you would expect. Um, and it's not the free and open source um, standalone solution. So the Docker CAS, um, the platform itself and the supporting products, they support the build, ship, run uh, workflow. So on the left, we have um, you know, our development environments uh, that we're using to create, that we're using to create uh, container-based applications. Um, so we can think of things like Docker uh, Toolbox, Docker uh, for Mac, which is currently in beta, but you guys can sign up and get access to it at beta.docker.com. Uh, once we have our, our, um, our images, we need to store them securely in a registry. Uh, where do we do that? Uh, we offer um, you know, container-based solutions to uh, you know, store these images. You can lock them down to certain work groups. You can provide role-based access control to control who actually gets image, uh, access to which images. Uh, we can sign the images. We can scan the images for known vulnerabilities. Um, and then once we actually have our images um, built and uh, stored in, in, in the registry, we need to push them out and we need to run them at scale. And that is, uh, we can, whether that's in the cloud or if that's in the data center or somewhere in between, we can um, use our, uh, our, our cloud and on-premise solutions to support that. Um, so that's exactly, so what is Docker Cloud? It's exactly the, um, uh, it's a managed service, it's a software as a service offering that is hosted by Docker. Uh, it enables enterprise teams to build, uh, test, deploy, manage distributed Docker applications in any cloud environment. <clears throat> so some of the key capabilities that come with Docker Cloud that we want to highlight um, today, and specifically in the context of the CI and CD demos. Um, so Docker Cloud comes with its own managed build service. Uh, so you can configure that with your source repository, with GitHub, and you can run uh, automated builds based on you know, any changes that you're pushing to uh, GitHub. Uh, we're releasing support for additional source code providers uh, very soon, but today it's basically all configured with GitHub. Uh, once we have our images, we can of course run tests against them um, and, um, um, uh, uh, and we'll show you a couple different paths which you can do that, but um, we'll run through that part in, uh, that is part of the first demo. Uh, once we have our automated builds and automated tests, we of course can then store them in Docker Hub. So Docker Hub and Docker Cloud use the same uh, registry service. So when we log into Docker Cloud, we will see the same images that we've already stored on Docker Hub. Uh, it comes with a web UI as well as a CLI and a RESTful uh, API interface. And we can use this to create as simple as, uh, sim apps as simple as a single droplet or uh, multi, um, uh, more complex multi-service applications. Um, so build and test, but we can also actually launch infrastructure directly through Docker Cloud as well. So it comes uh, out of the box with native integration through Amazon Web Services, DigitalOcean, Azure. Um, you can securely link to these cloud providers or you can even bring your own nodes, uh, deploy the Docker Cloud agent onto the, any internet connected um, machine and then man it, use Docker Cloud to manage the, uh, the you know, containers and the services that you're deploying onto those nodes. And then finally, there's the visibility into all of your uh, containers and your applications, right? So you can see the logs, you can see the service history, you can start, stop, terminate, uh, and redeploy uh, services as you like. So um, just a quick refresher on continuous integration, um, which will be the focus of the demo. Um, I'm sure all of you are well familiar with it, but just as a refresher, uh, development practice where teams are constantly integrating their, their code. Uh, we're usually doing this at least once a day to um, create multiple integrations per day. Um, each integration is verified by an automated build and an automated test um, so that we can quickly detect errors in our, in our code and uh, resolve them quickly. And um, this, of course, goes hand in hand with continuous delivery, um, which is the uh, discipline of 
building software in a way that we can we can release the application to production at any time. Doesn't mean we will, but uh, we, we in fact can if we want to. Um, so this, like I said, goes hand in hand with, with continuous integration. Um, it requires to achieve this, we need extensive automation across our entire workflow. We need automated builds, we need automated tests, um, and uh, you know, a close working relationship between all of those that are involved. So why are we doing this? Most importantly, reduce risk. Um, deploying smaller changes means that there's less that can possibly go wrong if you're committing you know, six lines of code. It's much more easy to detect errors, um, and integration becomes that much more easier. And most importantly, um, you know, this, this helps us establish that connection uh, uh, more appropriately with the customer where we get user feedback more frequently. We're creating faster iteration cycles, we're deploying more frequently, um, and we can make sure that our inherent assumptions that we're making when we're building the product are test by uh, closing that feedback cycle as quickly as, as possible and using that feedback to iterate into uh, future rounds of uh, iterations of the product. All right, so um, with this, let's quickly walk through uh, what a CI and CD um, uh, pipeline will look within the context of Docker Cloud. So this should be a fairly similar, uh, uh, familiar pattern. We will be using a sample voting app, simple Python app, two, to, two services uh, that will be stored on GitHub. Uh, we'll configure Docker Cloud with our GitHub repository, um, which will add a webhook to uh, GitHub, and every time we commit a change, it will trigger an automated build. Uh, it will copy down the application code, the tests, the Docker file, we'll run a build, if the build is successful, we'll then run a series of tests. If the tests are successful, we'll then push the image into our uh, registry and uh, subsequently set up our uh, node clusters for auto redeployment when uh, a successful image is in fact pushed. All right, so enough of the slides. <laughs> and this is a live demo, so Bear with us here. All right, so first thing we'll do is take a look at our uh, simple voting app. So this is um, in GitHub. Um, like I said, it's a Python app, two different services. We have a results service and we have a voting service. Uh, voting service basically collects uh, user input. It's got a web interface. Um, we'll be storing the results in uh, Redis, Redis cache. We have our Docker file, which will tell us how to build the image. We have uh, what we refer to as a Docker Compose test file. So when we're creating, we're running automated tests. Um, when we want to run automated tests, we can use this file to uh, run any uh, predefined tests that we want. Um, in this case, it's just a very simple, uh, you know, hell, you know, test pass um, echo. But we can point to any um, file with any test scripts that we want to uh, execute. Hooks, so this is the other uh, component for automated tests. So hooks allow us to run scripts at multiple phases of the build process. So this could be pre-build, uh, pre post-build, pre-test, post-test, uh, pre post-test, or pre-push uh, or post-push. So prior to pushing to the repository, we can run a series of tests. After it's successfully pushed, we can also run a series of tests. And a similar pattern for uh, for our results app as well. Um, again, we will have a Docker Compose test file as well as a series of um, series of hooks files. Okay, so let's run this application, see what it looks like on my machine. I'm gonna do a simple Docker Compose up. And can you guys see my Is that better? All right. Okay, so this is pulling down. Cool. This is pulling down the uh, respective layers, and we can now view our application here locally on my machine. Uh, Again, it's a simple, this is our voting, this is our voting view, right? We can just select dogs or cats, and then we can see the output um, output here. So, so that's great. Now let's jump into Docker Cloud. 
All right, so Dr. Cloud, um, I mentioned there's a um, few changes that we've made recently to Docker Cloud. Uh, it's recently entered uh, general availability in March. Uh, earlier this month, we also introduced a UI update, uh, which you'll see here is fairly different. It's using more of a material design. Um, it's a little bit flatter, but the same fundamental concepts apply to uh, what you had seen previously with um, the old interface. So we have our familiar stacks, services, and containers. Brian and Alberto will go into those a little more uh, detailed later. Um, what we want to focus on right now is um, is uh, creating two repositories and one for each of the services that are being used in the application. So to do that, <clears throat> so one other point to mention, um, and I alluded to this earlier, cloud uses the same registry that, um, that Hub does. So when I log into cloud, I use my Docker ID and I can see all the same images that I've already created in, in, in Hub. Um, so you have this you know, bi-directional uh, relationship with, with your repos. So I'm gonna create a repo, and in this case we will call it, um, call it voting. Give it a quick name. I can optionally select the visibility if I want it private or public. Um, in this case, I'll just make it public. And we'll go ahead and create that. Repo, okay, good. And now what we wanna do is, this is just an empty repo. Um, what we wanna do is configure this to point to our uh, uh, GitHub, our, our repository on GitHub. And I will select the Docker Cloud namespace, loading demo app, and um, we have a few different options here. So, <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, Docker is, of course, going to build this application for us. So, where do we want to run that run that build? Is that uh, there's two options. One is on Docker Cloud infrastructure directly, or uh, we can also run it on our own on our own node. So, Brian and Roberto will go into the process of actually attaching your own infrastructure um, to Docker Cloud. But in this case, we just want to run it on on Docker Cloud directly. Um, auto test, so this is the automated test capabilities that we had alluded to previously. So on any commit, uh, Docker Cloud will uh, run a series of tests that are defined in the Docker uh, uh, composed.test.yaml uh, file and um, you know, basically uh, you know, tell us whether they're, determine if the image will, will push based on the results of those tests. Um, we're gonna give, we have an uh, option here to create a, um, a tag mapping, so we're going to call it um, the image. We're going to call it latest. Latest. We will define the location of the Docker file, which is in our voting directory, and we will call it um, master. All right. So we will save this. Okay, and we have added a, a webhook successfully to GitHub. And we can see that it is empty. We will start this trigger a build. So this is copying down the application source code. It's copying the test files as well as the Docker um, the Docker file. And we will, um, you know, we're building this app. We're building this service. Let's create one additional service. In this case, will be for the results service. And again, we'll make this public. And again, empty repo that we need to configure with our GitHub repository. So same pattern, we're going to point to our Docker Cloud, our Cloud Demo uh, namespace, the voting demo repo, and we'll build it on Docker Cloud infrastructure, configure the tests, point to the appropriate location for the Docker file, and save. All right, so trigger this build. Again, same process. Um, and we can jump through and see, of course, we don't have a build successful yet, so tags, uh, the version of this, this image is not available. Um, but we can see in a timeline view all of the history of the activities that have occurred for 
um, this given repo. All right, so while this is building, take a look at a couple different things here. I just wanna make sure. Looks like voting is successful. Yep, that build finished. And let's take a look at our results service. Looks like this is still in progress. Yes, it is. Okay. Yep, sorry. Better. Okay. Um, so a couple things that we can point out here while we're waiting for the uh, build to complete. Um, one is we created our repo from scratch. We can also import repos from third-party registries. So if you have a, a repo in Quay or um, uh, another uh, hosted registry, you can actually import those repos directly into cloud. Um, we can also configure cloud to um, notifications are available in cloud so that we can get notified within Slack and email whenever um, important events on services, stacks, or uh, repos uh, occur. So if I jump into my Slack account and I've created a channel called demo channel, you'll see all of the activities that are related to the actions that we just took. So in this case, uh, voting was successful um, and actually results was successful as well. So I can stay in band in my, my Slack channel and not have to keep flipping back and forth um, in order to see what the status updates are. Okay, so we have our two uh, repos that have been uh, created, right? So we've um, just go back to our uh, illustration. Uh, we've configured GitHub uh, to point to, uh, or, or cloud to point to, to GitHub. Uh, we have our two repos. Now when we uh, apply a change to this repo, of course it will kick off an automated build, run the automated test, and then optionally uh, push the image to the registry if it's successful. So let's go ahead and make a change to this application. <clears throat> change to the voting directory. And we'll just simply modify the app.py file. All right, so you saw that previously the two options were cats and dogs. Let's change that to um, change that to sharks and blues. All right. Cool. All right, so what's going to happen here? Before we do our git push, let's open up Docker Cloud. You running side by side. So if everything's working properly, uh, we uh, submit a git push, we should see the pipeline kick off and see the automated build triggered within, uh, within Docker Cloud. Right? Within, yeah, sure. All right, so it did, so we're triggered uh, we triggered a, uh, a build for both our repo, both the result and the voting repo. Um, this will take a couple minutes to complete. <clears throat> but in the process, we can show you a couple other things. All right. So one of the other features that uh, we did release, I guess it was about two weeks ago now, um, is Docker security scanning. So, it actually has that. Cool. So, Docker security scanning um, 
uh, is available in Docker Cloud. Um, and what it does is run, it will uh, check your images for known vulnerabilities um, and it will do so against, cross-check against uh, uh, popular CV databases and tell you where you know, vulnerabilities exist within your images. And this does binary level scanning. Uh, you can see at the individual component level where your vulnerabilities exist um, and take action as necessary. We'll also notify you via email when new vulnerabilities are detected uh, so that you can always stay uh, up to date with the security of your, your Docker um, container pipeline. So this is available today to Docker Cloud users, uh, paid subscribers. So if you go into your, billing, your account settings and your plan section, you just simply check this box uh, to enable uh, monitoring of uh, Docker security scanning. And we will subsequently um, uh, scan each new change to uh, an image um, on, on push. All right, so we saw a notification that the build was complete. And let's take a look here. We saw that completed a minute ago. And the results appears to still be in progress, but <clears throat> results did complete. So you should see a tag here, which is the latest image. And we also see our timeline, which has been updated with the logs of the, um, of the build. So uh, we see that the, uh, the output from our tests have successfully um, completed here. So this is it was just simply echoing. Uh, this is a pre-test, pre-build test. This is a uh, post-build test. This is a pre-test test, so on. Um, and of course, that the, the build is successfully complete. So that is um, that is more or less the extent of what we wanted to show from the configuration of a CI pipeline in cloud. Um, what we will focus on in the next part of the demo is uh, configuring um, infrastructure, launching infrastructure directly within Docker Cloud and configuring it to, um, to auto redeploy when we do have changes to, uh, uh, changes occurred on our specific repos. So before we do this, I want to set up a team in Docker Hub that we will use to share these images with my teammates. So I'm just gonna name here real quick. So This team. So what we have here is I have three previous teams. Um, teams have members, and once we have a team, we can then assign uh, permissions uh, to that team on a repo level. So I'm going to go back into my repo view. Again, we're using the same registry on cloud as in hub. So I see my voting in my results app. Uh, if I open up my voting app, I can now add collaborators. And in this case, I want to add my um, Docker Cloud team, but first I do need to add Brian and Alberto to that team. And Alberto. All right, so jump back to where we were. We have our voting, our results service. We are going to now add Docker Cloud demo team with write access. So this means they can pull, they can push to this repo. It's good. And then we will also update our results service. Well, Docker Cloud demo team, sign write access. Okay. So if everything's working perfectly, then when Alberto and Brian um, log into their Docker accounts, they will then see, as a member of this Docker, uh, this cloud organization, they will then see our uh, results in uh, voting uh, services. And, okay. So that's the conclusion of the first demo. Um, I'll hand it over to Brian and Alberto.
you guys, you don't need this. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. All right, hi everyone. I'm Brian. I'm a product manager for Docker Cloud, along with Ryan. And with me is Alberto. He's an engineer for Docker Cloud. And so we're going to pick up right where Ryan left off with the CI capabilities, and we're going to be demonstrating the continuous deployment. And so by the end of this, we'll have an automated continuous uh, workflow from code to production um, that's uh, completely automated without having to set it up after the initial steps. Uh, so to start, we're going to provision infrastructure. So with Docker Cloud, you can provision infrastructure with some of the um, cloud providers that we natively integrate with. These include AWS, DigitalOcean, Azure, SoftLayer, and Packet. And so with these, we natively integrate with their API and provision infrastructure on your behalf. Uh, so we're going to connect to DigitalOcean for this demo. So here we're registering with their OAuth. Right, and if your uh, if your cloud provider is not shown in that list, we have a feature called Bring Your Own Node, and what this allows you to do is pretty much provide any other cloud provider, uh, as long as it's a Linux box with one of the supported Linux distributions um, shown here, or it can be a VM on your own laptop or behind a firewall. Basically, as long as you run this script right here, it will register the node with Docker Cloud, and then we can provision uh, infrastructure and we can provision applications to that node. All right, so let's go ahead and deploy a node cluster on DigitalOcean. So we have a concept of nodes and node clusters, and a node cluster is a group of nodes, kind of like a template of uh, the same provider, region, and type. So here we are in the uh, node cluster wizard, and here's a deploy label. So we have uh, deploy labels, which is a nice feature to help you do targeted deployments. So you can give deploy labels to each of your pieces of infrastructure, to each of your node clusters. Uh, so a common use case, for example, is tagging one set of node clusters as your production and one as staging. And then when you deploy your applications, you can simply define the deploy label, deploy constraint it belongs to, and you can make sure your correct application ends up on the correct infrastructure. So here we're choosing DigitalOcean from the dropdown. Choose the region, type and size, and we'll go ahead and launch. This usually takes anywhere between two to five minutes. Uh, so in the meantime, we can look at the timeline. Like Ryan said, uh, this lists all of the different actions that have been taken against this object. It includes the location and the IP address of where the action originated from. And we have our logs here. So actually, we're working on a feature called streaming logs, and you'll be able to get logs live uh, soon within pretty much any, any, whenever you're deploying any object, you'll be able to see the logs live as they occur. All right, and so we're going to, um, you see on the sidebar here, we have uh, the notion of an application and infrastructure, right? And Docker Hub is encapsulated within what Brian just demonstrated with the build and repository section. So we have a notion of containers, services, and stacks to make your applications. Uh, so containers you're all familiar with. It's uh, the instantiation of one of your images. A service is a group or similar to a node cluster. It's a template of containers all running the exact same image and tag. And a stack is a logical grouping of services. So it's very similar to a Docker Compose file. And we have, um, a slightly, uh, we have a custom file format called a stack file, which is a YAML file just like Docker Compose. 
and they have a pretty much one-to-one -one compatibility, but the Docker Compose, or the stack file, has some additional keys that we're gonna use that directly integrate with Docker Cloud's APIs and features. And so we're gonna pull up the stack file, and I'll kinda walk you through what's going on here. So here we have our four services, the Redis results, voting, and the load balancer. The Redis is our cache, it's gonna be storing all of our votes so that we can pull them up again in the results uh, application. We have our results and voting app with the key auto redeploy set to true, and that's uh, specifically for continuous deployment. So this means whenever now there's a uh, update to the image that those, are, those services are based off of, it'll kick off a redeploy of that specific service. And you can see here in the image, we're able to use the uh, cloud org image that Ryan shared with us. Um, and this is the beginning of our uh, team and org features being brought into Docker Cloud. So soon we'll have complete feature parity with Docker Hub. You'll have the exact same team and orgs you experience there within Docker Cloud. Um, similar to Docker Compose, we have links, ports, um, something unique to the stack file here for the voting application is the target number of containers. So right here within the YAML file, you can specify before you deploy how many, uh, how many containers you want to be running um, in the service. So it's declarative. And here's our load balancer. So it's actually, we're using a custom image that the Docker Cloud team has built. It's an HA proxy image and it's um, integrated with our APIs, and so it actually listens to the events happening within the service. So for example, whether you uh, start with two containers, scale up to 10, back down to five, the HA proxy is listening to these events, and it'll automatically reconfigure itself on the fly without you having to configure or touch anything. So if you're interested in load balancing, um, highly suggest you check out the Docker Cloud HA proxy. All right, so let's go ahead and deploy this uh, stack for create and deploy. So we also allow you to only create without deploying the application, uh, just in case you want to uh, create a template and basically modify it. And you can actually share that template, that stack file with your fellow developers and you can edit it and then once you feel comfortable it's ready to go out, then you can hit deploy. So here we see the timeline again. Uh, we can see it's pulling the base image, uh, the layers for the base images. And if we go to general, we can actually see a little bit more information about what's going on with our stack. So we see here the Redis um, service has actually been deployed already. The voting and results app uh, services are being deployed and we'll be notified as these things come online. And we have our endpoint section. So any of the ports that were published in the stack file, those will show up in the endpoint section here. So we'll be able to visit our results and voting app um, as soon as they're done deploying. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we have our stack file. So you can it's here to reference. So anyone can go in and see what exactly is in the stack and we can download it and share it um, to your other developers, so it's really easy to quickly replicate and deploy a copy of another stack. Um, so usually what uh, a common use case with Docker Cloud is a user will take that stack file, just have the, change the deployment tags to match their staging environment and their, uh, their staging uh, Docker images. Once that's working, they just copy the stack file over, change those few key items, and then deploy it to the prod. So let's go ahead and visit our application. And we'll make sure it works. All right, it seems to be working. And down here, actually, you can see vote processed by the container name. So that shows our load balancer is working. So let's go ahead and refresh, and you'll see that it changes based upon the container it's hitting. So this is a load balanced application 
on Docker, uh, on Docker Cloud on DigitalOcean. All right, so next we're going to um, we're going to make an edit to the stack file. Let's go ahead and change the sharks versus blues to dev versus ops. So we have to pull the changes that Ryan made earlier on the repo. All right, git push. And so now the whole entire end-to-end -end automated cycle is now happening right now. So let's go ahead and pull up the windows of the build and service list so we can see when the auto, auto builds and when the redeploy happens. And so what's happening right now, um, so in the beginning, Ryan gave us access to a uh, Docker image. So now we have, access, we, have, we have the ability to deploy it on his behalf. And the change in source code triggers a auto build. That auto build has a test inside of it. And so if that test fails, the build is, uh, does not complete. And so it stops the whole chain right there. So we don't have incorrect code out and being redeployed. So once the test is successfully passing, then the auto build will happen. It'll push the new image and replace the uh, latest Docker image. And then since we set those uh, auto redeploy flags to true, that's going to send a signal to those two specific services to kick off a redeploy with the latest image version. And like we did earlier, like I remember um, brought up earlier, we deployed this on DigitalOcean, so this will all be taking place uh, on that infrastructure. Then as these actions are being carried out, we have the notifications in Slack and email to tell us the progress of these and whether they've failed or succeeded. This is actually the exact same workflow that the Docker Cloud team uses to develop Docker Cloud staging environment. So we have each of our developers, they'll fork the, uh, they'll fork Docker Cloud, work on their feature, do a pull request, and once that pull request is merged, it kicks off this entire chain and staging is up and ready without having to do any other kind of ops work. So it's, it's really nice. Yeah, so it looks like we missed the results being redeployed. So voting should be redeployed soon here. Um, I can also go over some of the new features we have on the roadmap too. So like Ryan mentioned, we have the new UI here. Um, it's still a work in progress. We're developing it every single day and we're making lots of fixes and improvements to make it, we basically want it to be as easy to organize and find the specific objects you're working with. So um, a lot of people are working with hundreds of services, tens of nodes, uh, dozen of stacks, and it can be kind of difficult to find what you're looking for. So we're introducing features like search, filtering, um, giving, being able to give custom names to objects, as well as uh, the teams and orgs features that are on the way that allow you to give access and permissions based upon these three groups here. So you can give specific access to uh, your repos and builds, uh, read, write, and admin, as well as infrastructure, being able to deploy and provision nodes and application level so that you can make sure you know who exactly is capable of what actions on the platform. Um, our CI capabilities are also, we're working to improve them to improve the speed and performance of our builds as well as being able to give you the um, control and parallelism for your builds, for your build pipeline so that if you have a team uh, working on it, working on your development, you never have to have any of them waiting in a queue. So it looks like it redeployed. So if we refresh the endpoint here, we should see diverse ops. All 
All right, so it worked. <laughs> so simple git push to the source code repository um, results, no other intervention after five minutes, um, updated code to our live environments on DigitalOcean. And obviously, like we said earlier, you can provision nodes from whatever infrastructure provider you want or including on your laptop. So we've had interesting use cases where, for example, an admin had each of his graphic designers register their own laptop. They spun up a VM and they would register it with bring your own node. And then each of them were able to test their local environment in the cloud on their laptop uh, through Docker Cloud. So there's a bunch of really cool, interesting use cases that um, are popping up every day that are now capable because of, of containers. Um, so at this point, we want to open it up for uh, feedback, so please try it out. You can sign up at cloud.docker.com. If you have a Hub account, it means you have a Docker ID, which means you can sign in to Docker Cloud, and all of your repos will be here waiting for you when you log in. Um, you can reach us uh, at the beginning of this. I think we'll be sharing this presentation. You can reach us on Twitter, um, email, and we have a forum at forums.docker.com. So please feel free to reach out with any feedback you have. Um, and that's about it. So we are actually gonna have a office hours for the Docker Cloud team. We'll be back in these two tables at the back of the room to answer any of your specific questions. Uh, but for now, we'll open it up to uh, any general questions you guys may have. So yes. that's one of the things, I mean, caching has really changed our world, but being able to build in parallel with a build matrix would be super sweet. Is that something you have on the roadmap or we can do today? Yeah, we currently have build parallelism and you'll be able to control the build parallelism uh, soon. That solves every problem I have, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I could help. <laughs> Awesome. Ryan, let's connect after we're Docker partners, and um, I would love to put that in sooner than later. We have the question here next. I'm going to pass, uh, pass that mic. Oh, you got a question? Uh, so uh, you mentioned about like uh, the continuous uh, delivery, right, deployment. So what you build is what you deploy, right? Yes. If, so yeah, whatever you set that auto redeploy flag. So we didn't show you going through uh, creating the webhooks. First, you would create a webhook specifically for that uh, service to that uh, image. Right. And so when that image updates, it kicks off that redeploy. Right. right. So my question is like, um, we sometimes have uh, a build with the uh, build time dependencies, right? And uh, an application runs uh, when the application runs in production, you have uh, runtime dependencies. So the build time dependencies are not always same as runtime dependencies. So uh, how do we uh, address that issue here? So with, with the runtime dependencies actually, um, based on the links in the stack file, it, Docker Cloud automatically knows what service depends on what service, so that we'll actually deploy them in a sequence that is mindful of those dependencies. Do you have um, build? Because like, for example, uh, if you're like building something with the uh, dev config package involved, right? Uh, and then uh, for production, you need some production specific packages. So you don't want the production specific packages at the build time, right? So like, how do we get the production packages into the, the production image uh, and not in the build image? Because the build image is frozen at the build time. So we cannot edit it to the production, right? You know, Mehdi, or? That might be a question, that might be a good question. Okay. So, yeah, that's, if, you, if you wanna get into the details, sit down. Okay, sure, okay. <laughs> Are you, you're next, you wanna just uh, go real quick? Yeah. So the question was, when I do a redeploy, what happens to the underlying machine, the infrastructure? 
So the, in this case, the VM from DigitalOcean. So we leave it alone, nothing happens to that. But um, what is interesting is we do a sequential redeploy. So if you have more than one container in your service and you do a redeploy, we'll actually make sure, uh, it won't ensure zero time redeploy, zero downtime redeploys, but we try to make it as much as possible. So usually if you're running four to five, four or more containers in your service, it pretty much is like a zero downtime. Um, but to, to reach true zero downtime redeploys, you definitely want a load balancer and to configure that yourself. Right, the machine is unaffected. We, we have, so we, when we install our Docker agent, we also uh, deploy a, a handful of system containers, and the system containers do things like image cleanup. So over time, um, we make sure to keep your node, uh, we, we make sure to keep your application as minimal of a footprint as possible. Right, we have service discovery and an overlay network. Um, so basically when you, you can have nodes within across multiple cloud providers, across multiple regions, and you can deploy an application across all of those different cloud providers and regions, and they all talk to each other as if they're on the same network. Regarding, you can deploy in the cloud on digital ocean, right? So you can deploy in AWS and on on-prem as well. Can you talk them together by using a Docker lib network? Or? So just what we mentioned earlier, the overlay network and the service discovery allows all of those nodes, no matter where you deploy them, behind the firewall, on your own laptop, they all can talk to each other and are aware of one another. But you need to use a Docker lib network, right? Can I use some SEN? You just to deploy, to, to currently you just deploy, um, you just use our bring your own node feature, so you would have to run a script that installs a Docker That's agent. Good, right? Yeah, in each uh, cloud, right, or each host. Right, yep. So you like, create type overlay networking? Sorry, what? By using an agent, right? Yeah. The agent script, we're gonna create the overlay networking. Yeah, whether you provision uh, infrastructure from one of our native providers or from bring your own node, we're, we're, deploy, we're installing our Docker Cloud agent. Okay. And the agent is in the, those system containers, like I mentioned earlier, that's what kind of provides all the magic behind so Docker can, Cloud. Can I run Mesos and Kubernetes on top, like USB, or need to be changing? Um, yeah, you can. I'm gonna pass the... Okay, uh, if you run a long running application, also such as the, it has a, some kind of state transition application. If you run the, the, the uh, deployment, then during running the application and deploying, what is happening? Sorry, can you, can you repeat that question? Okay, if you are long running tran uh, application, such as a transaction type of application, and during the in-flight transaction, then deployment happening. What happened in the deployment? It is it doesn't work. I see. So it is waiting until the, the that application finish. So if you if you run the continuously running that kind of application, it cannot finish forever. Um, yeah, so just curious, is it kind of like a rolling deployment? Um, so if you have like incompatible versions of software, um, will they coexist at the exact same time during the uh, deployment? Um, and if so, like how is that handled? Yeah, so when, when you have multiple containers, it is a, a rolling redeployment, um, but for specifically like exposing a new feature um, and you have two different versions of your application, what we suggest then is doing something like a blue-green deployment so you would set them both behind like our, our HA proxy, for example, and 
once you have your new version running, you would simply point to the uh, HA proxy to point from your service A to your service B. Uh, you can include it in the, your, you, you want your load balancer to be um, separate, I believe. Oh, it's right, double X. Yeah, it's one X. Yeah. Let's try this. Okay. Um, would you be able to configure like a custom health check for the for the application? Yeah, I, I know people have. Um, so what you can actually do is you can use our bring your node feature with AWS, and you can actually use some of the. Uh, some of the services that AWS provides on top of your nodes while still registering them with Docker Cloud. So you can still deploy using Docker Cloud on that infrastructure, um, just not using our native integration. Behind you. So this might be have a real easy answer, but um, is there a standard way or a feature that would allow a container to like report its own identity, like deployment ID or something? Um, understand my question? Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, like if you have an application and you want to be able to um, display within the app, like the the deployment ID or hash or something like that, is there like a standard kind of yeah version, or is there best practice or feature built in around that, or? We have to roll roll our own for that. Yeah, we like a build ID. Okay, yeah, yeah, we we have that. <laughs> Another question back there. Uh, there's not a direct integration with it, um, but it's not, we're not stopping you from using it. So the question, sorry, was uh, can you use Kubernetes with Docker Cloud? I'll repeat your question. What, what, Yeah, we have a lot of people using outside CI providers like Circle CI, uh, Jenkins. It's um, it's easy, easy to set up. We use webhooks, and you can do integrations like that. Uh, we also provide integrations with. So I guess the idea behind Docker Cloud is to provide this end-to-end -end platform um, to, to easily use containers, and we we provide basic level monitoring, logs, uh, networking, and everything, and orchestration. Uh, but if you want a more advanced or you want your uh, current solution, we allow you to plug those in along the way. So a lot of people use New Relic or Datadog uh, with us, uh, CircleCI, Logly. <clears throat> yep, triggers that auto, uh, auto build and auto redeploy. Uh, right behind you, do you have a microphone? Uh, are you uh, persisting data in any way across deploys, or are you, are you relying on your customers to set up uh, liable data storage? So we do have um, a notion of volumes, so you can set up volumes to do that. Where are those stored on the, the nodes that you're deploying to, or do you have a central service? Uh, yeah, you'd, you'd have to set that up. Back there. So I came late and I missed entire present, your entire presentation. That's I'll why I have a couple of dumb it. questions. Please <laughs> forgive me for those. Uh, but in, on resource management, there's a lot of noise about you know different resource managers. Uh, what is your strategy? 
Are you building your own resource manager? Yeah, that's, that's with the computer over there. Or, um, you know, just that question. And second, when you discuss the overlay network, are you able, are you satisfied with the performance you're achieving? Okay, so with, uh, with resource management, like I said earlier, we, we provide basic levels of resource management, um, but to do things, um, like we, we have an auto, an auto trigger for, an auto scale trigger uh, to, so you, we, we allow you to do custom solutions to help deal with these kind of uh, use cases, but we don't provide anything out of the box. So we're, we've tried to stay as flexible as possible, um, but we don't necessarily provide that. We, although we are looking into um, having things like auto scale for the nodes and everything. So well, last question, um, and then we have to get to ending out. But we're going to be here afterwards, so we're going to be hanging out. We can ask all the questions. So we're going to be here. So uh, do you have any plans to uh, add uh, internal load balancer so that for service-to-service -service, uh, communications, uh, you don't need to rely on DNS round robin? Sorry, what was the question? Yeah, so right now for internal service-to-service -service communications, you need to rely to, for D to DNS round robin. So if I, do you have any plans to add uh, internal load balancer, something like Q-Proxy, for example, on Kubernetes? Yeah, we were looking into having kind of like a load balancer as a service. So right now it's it's pretty easy, but we know it could be a little bit easier uh, to get your load balancer set up. Um, so yeah, we're we're looking at we we really want Docker Cloud to be that kind of that that layer that automates and makes things as easy as possible for you. So some of those things, along with um, like automatic and custom wizards. So when we when you pull up the wizard to deploy a service. Um, we're hoping that it could read the the Docker image and only put the fields that you would po you would uh, possibly require and show those to you. So we're, we're looking at a bunch of uh, things to help the user experience and make it as dead simple as possible to get started in to do powerful use cases with Docker. All right, so that was the last question. We have a, another presenter, but please feel free after the meetup to talk to us at the uh, office hours. Now we'd like to uh, have a short lightning round, a uh, 15 minute lightning round, and we'd like to introduce uh, Jobstart, who is a Docker Cloud customer, and uh, they are going to walk through how they're using the cloud. Yeah. Test, test. a quick plug about uh, what Jobstart is. So how many people here have actually been contacted by a recruiter in the past two weeks? Right? So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to flip the model, actually build a trustworthy solution for job placement. So it's kind of like a mentorship network uh, where we have mentors who like run on, run on the Gal uh, Google self-driving car team, the creator of React Native, and then they plug into our jobs tools. And so we've loved Docker Cloud for the past couple months now. Uh, Andrew set it all up and he's going to be talking Pretty appropriately, it sounds like about blue and green deployments. So, cool. hey guys. So before anyone asks, seven feet tall. So just clear that out ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, yeah, like jobs, like uh, Zach said at Jobstart, we're sort of building a sort of like destroy all recruiters type system, um, so that engineers can have a, some really crazy awesome tools to basically find their own awesome jobs without even worrying about recruiters, that you guys will be able to basically search for jobs from pretty much every job site known to man. Um, tracking, video chat, talking with people like the guy who created React Native, we're a um, huge expert network, but that's not really what this is about. This is more about blue-green deployments, which sounds appropriate given some of the questions that happened during the last round, so let's get to it. Um, so start with a quote, uh, releasing software is too often an art, it should be an engineering discipline. And I think this is really appropriate given the transition that's being made right now from like traditional sysops to DevOps. Um, disclaimer, I'm not a DevOps guy, I'm actually a full stack guy who always gets roped into DevOps, which I don't hate, it's fun. But um, you know, I'm sure most of you know quite a bit more about this than I do, just a upfront disclaimer. 
Um, so what is blue-green deployment? I mean, the, basically the general gist is you have two identical production environments called blue and green. Easy enough. Um, Netflix, <coughs> they call it um, red-black. There's a lot of different variances of this, but it's basically the same thing. The idea is that for every service, you have two different clusters running simultaneously, but only one of the clusters is actually in production, right? Um, one of, the, one of the clusters is scaled up to n number of instances, right? Like depending on your load, that may be dynamic. Um, you can use something like Datadog to use webhooks for the triggers he was talking about before to scale up more instances if, if you need it. And you can use the Docker Cloud CLI to scale them down. But in any case, you have two clusters. One has n number of instances. The other one only has one instance. The, the one that has one instance is your last deploy. So every time you deploy, what we do is we switch between blue and green, we deploy to the inactive cluster, we scale it up, we test it, and then we simply flip a switch. So the load balancer goes from pointing to the old copy to the new copy, so it's zero downtime. So why blue-green? Um, and I think some of the questions from the last round kind of make some of this uh, self-explanatory. Um, requiring downtime to deploy a service is really unnecessarily painful. Um, you end up having to build lots of infrastructure both on the front end and the back end to accommodate service deploys, which cause services you know, to go down traditionally. So um, you know, we, we definitely want to build self-healing and reliable systems, but we don't want it to break every time we deploy, right? We want the breaking to be an edge case so we don't have to build lots of complexity on top to handle that. So blue-green deployment kind of solves that. Um, and again, with microservices, zero downtime definitely equates with less ops level complexity because we don't need as much complexity because we don't anticipate downtimes with every deploy. Um, and Docker Cloud and HA Proxy, particularly the, Im particularly the image that the Docker Cloud folks, previously the Tutum folks, I believe, uh, have baked, it, it's reactive. So it hooks up to the Docker Cloud API and it makes it really, really easy to like link the new deployment to the existing load balancer, and the load balancer just magically points over to it. Zero work to make it work. Um, and one of the other benefits with blue-green deployment is that rollback doesn't require a redeploy. So if you deploy something and all of a sudden your users are sending you thousands of emails because you happen to be Facebook, and um, they're talking about their messaging just randomly stopped working, you don't have to wait for your deployment to go through a second time. All you have to do is flip the switch back over to the existing deploy and scale it up. It's already running, you just have to scale it up. So, um, you know, getting more into the how it works, every service should be divided into two variant clusters, at least two. Um, at, at job start, we use three because we have a dev running in the same cluster, but it's a bit of an aside. Um, with HA proxy load balancing the active cluster. On deployment, the CI, we use circle, um, should deploy to the non-active cluster. So when blue is active, the CI should deploy to green. The non-active cluster should be scaled up to the active scale and health checked. That can be something like, you know, um, like in Node.js, just using the process object and checking like CPU and memory usage, making sure everything looks normal, hitting some endpoints to make sure everything works. And once we know it works, we point the HA proxy instance to the new active cluster and we scale down the old instance down to one container. It's still running, we still wanna be able to roll back really quickly, but you know, we don't wanna eat up you know, precious CPU time on our AWS instances and drive our costs up, so we scale it down. So before deployment, we have HA proxy pointing to blue with three containers and with green in one container, right? During deployment, we deploy and we scale green up to three with our new source code. And then after deployment, HA proxy is now pointing to green. Simple enough. And like I said, Docker Cloud makes this pretty darn easy. Um, you know, if you're using like ELB, you have to write some pretty gnarly code to make this work. It's not supported right out of the box. So you, have, you end up having to homebrew a lot of this. And with HA proxy's image, it, it's trivial. All you have to do is, you know, link the container, literally. And there, it's, like a, it's like one command to link. So if you're using the Docker Cloud CLI, it's super easy. And this means that developers don't really need anything from DevOps to make this work. It, it just kind of works, which is great. So one of the kind of um, little caveats with this is that your, your CI, your build, has to actually know what state your cluster's in. So it has to know whether or not green is active or blue is, because it has to target the, the cluster that it wants to deploy to. 
Um, we built a little tool. It's been in a gist for a while. I tweeted it out a few weeks ago. Probably none of you know about it, but um, put it on GitHub. It's a download. It's an installable npm package. So you can just npm install dash g dcbg Docker Cloud Blue Green, and it has spooky little you know command line help like most tools. And basically, it will just print either blue or green right out to standard out. So you can capture that in a variable, and you can use it with the Docker Cloud CLI to sort of like pivot which which cluster you're targeting. Cool, so I mean, just kind of a little demo. That's really annoying. <laughs> and wow, that looks, what's going on here? Maybe I need to like re-maximize it? No, that's not any better, oh well. So let's scroll down a little bit. I think I broke this. Um, so, I mean, here's our deploy script, right? So we grab the current code by running the non-NPN version of our script. Again, this has been published. We pass in a Docker Cloud API token, which is really all you need, other than meta information about like what the stack looks like. And then of course, said meta information. So your Docker Cloud user, your target, and some other fancy things. And all of this, you just run dash dash help on the tool that I mentioned, and it will print out exactly what you need to enter to grab this. You grab this, and then you just use the Docker Cloud CLI. So Docker Cloud service set, sync, which blocks until the command's done, so it guarantees that it's actually finished running. Um, we tell it to run the latest stream, which stream is just our socket cluster, but it hooks up to Rabbit, it's nothing special. We run the redeploy flag, and we point it at the environment variables that should be configured in our build. So like what the service is, the next code, and again, we grabbed the next code up here, simply by running that command line tool. And that sets it up and redeploys the green service in this case, so green would be inactive. Then we scale up the green service to three containers, which is our current active number that we're running in production. Um, in this one, we're not running a health check, but in one of the other services, we run a health check to actually make sure everything's good. When it, we know it's good, we scale down, and we, well, first we move the load balancer, so we, put, we, link, we unlink the load balancer from the old service and relink it to the new one all in one command, so it's, I mean, if, I guess if you get a request in, you have like one millisecond that Something may break, but oh well. Um, and then we relink it to the new one. And that's it. It's pretty simple. And um, I plan on posting these on like a gist at some point this week, and I'll tweet it at them if anyone follows Docker. I mean, it, they'll be up. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Right, so, gotcha. So we're using Docker Cloud's RESTful API, and it's, it's kind of a hack, but it should work for hopefully the long term. Um, basically what we do is we hit the, the API to pull down the, the load balancer object, right? Um, we hydrate it, and then we check to see which container is currently linked to the load balancer, and you provide, you, it, by default, it, it, it's blue and green are the two options, and the one that's not linked to it is the code that we return out the, the script. So, pretty simple. Sorry. Um, algorithmic fashion, you should be switching between blue and green. No, no, no. None of that. No, it's, 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 it's super simple. It's literally just, if green is currently running, we deploy to blue. If blue is currently running, we deploy to green. Excuse me? Is it supervised or is it automatic? Um, you might have to elaborate a little bit for me. No, it's it's on a CI server. So when, when I change source code on one of our main lines, and those two main lines are dev and master, this runs. It, it triggers a build on our CI server, and our CI server then acts on our behalf with a particular user that has scoped permissions to do exactly this, to make the changes to the cluster. What happens to the database or any shared resources that you have? Excuse me? Sorry. Like if your app has a database and you happen to say like bump the schema version between your blue gotcha. and deployment. So we actually currently have a setup for this. Um, we, we run automated migrations. So we drop migration scripts into our like currently monolith that we're kind of breaking apart at the moment. And when the build runs, we actually check, use it. basically we combine something called a selector with a mutator, 
the selector runs, which grabs all the records that need to be changed, that pipes it through a mutator function, and the mutation, mutator function applies changes to every record. So these scripts kind of live in the repo. If, if they don't need to be run, it'll just return zero, and it'll just keep going through other scripts. But that's, that's currently how we handle DB migration. Um, now, with regards to, like, if I make a breaking change to schema, um, the, we'll just bring our services offline and do a migration if that's the case. Are both the uh, Adam and Gwen? Yeah, the same database, um, but only one is accessible at any given point. So one is like sort of right. right. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if green, I mean, this is personally my philosophy. If green's going to run amok, um, I would assume it would run amok while it was live. So, um, you know, like both of them are both technically production code that have been fully tested. And, like, and I use like hardcore test automation with most of this, like 100% coverage. I'm a big believer in TDD. So it's not really something I worry about. You know, if, if, it, if it craps itself, I'll just run a backup. We use Compose. We don't even host our own data because it's, it's a pain. So... You're, so you're like you're talking about like A/B rollouts, sort of. Um, yeah, I mean, you you could technically do something like that. Um, you know, I don't know off the top of my head. It was, I, I mean, you know, if you if you if you ran with something like this, I would guess it'd probably be like you know six or eight hours of research to build something like that. But you know, it's yeah. I mean, I've thought about doing something like that, but it, I don't currently do it. Some question. Oh, no. Tons of people who our company is doing load balancing. Uh -huh. Exclusively for containers, and uh, you know, includes advanced networking technologies, resource management, and so on and so forth. How do you view those products? Those, you those yourself. The, the last part. Those what products? Products. Yeah. Um, you know, I just use HA Proxy. Um, it works for web sockets. It works for, and that's that's my main. Thing. Like with HTTP requests are easy to load balance web sockets are a little trickier and with HA proxy it's like environment variables and it just works. So I, I haven't, I, haven't, I mean we use Cloudflare on top which sort of has a poor man's load balancer to protect from like uh, like DDoS attacks. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have enough experience with a broad variety to really have an opinion. Because software defined networking sort of allows you to do load balancing sort of automatically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, HA proxy, you specify a strategy. So that can be round robin or source if you're doing web sockets or, you know, whatever you want. Whatever else you want. Yeah, exactly. No, so we, we have the old image, like the like we have current deployment and then last deployment, and they're both running. That way, if, if something breaks and we detect it, we just roll it back. So we just point the load balancer at the old cluster and scale it up. So um, does that answer your question? Sort of? Not really? Can you repeat it one more time? If you have a new image come up, right? So you're testing a new image. And when you're, when you're satisfied, you switch it. Mm -hmm. And what do you do to the old one? Do you go back and update the old one? No, we, we leave it running as is. Yeah. So um, running in an older, older way. Yeah. It is, but it's not accessible. Um, and there's nothing temporal on any of these. Um, like, for instance, like worker images, we sort of spawn them up and then we close them down on a con like a cron trigger. So nothing on any of these images are really stateful or temporal. So leaving them running is not really an issue. Uh, I mean, so if there's a vulnerability, it's it's not accessible from the outside. So, like the the, the image that's running that's not linked to the load balancer is literally inaccessible from the outside. Um, they would have to ha hack through Docker Cloud's infrastructure, which won't happen to get to our to get to that piece of infrastructure. So, um, you know, if we redeploy. The, the one that is exposed has the latest copy of everything, like the latest version of like the Ubuntu container, the latest version of the Node.js or Golang container, whatever. So, you know, it's not really something we've been worrying about. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right, thank you very much. No worries.